Thank you, Warren, and good morning, everyone. Uh, Tom, good morning to you. This is your second visit. You haven't heard me, so I'm to be the one to run you off. Uh, Proverbs chapter 22 is where we are, and a very, very famous, famous proverb. Now, I'm going to spend uh, a good portion of our time together on 22.6. We all know it. You don't even need to read it. Train up a child in the way he will go. Uh, so I have done a lot of detail because it is such an important proverb. Check that uh, out real quick. Sorry. Okay. Right. I'm not technically efficient. There, there we, we go. go. Yep. Um, so, 22.6, I am going to take you through all the details. I hope you're taking notes because uh, I really want you to understand what this proverb is saying. And then when we come to verses 7 through 9, we have uh, punishment of the wicked and blessing for the generous. So here are our proverbs this morning. Train up a child in the way he will go. We'll just leave it at that. We all know it. And then verse 7, the rich rule over the poor and the borrower is the servant of the lender. Eight, the one who sows injustice will reap, and this is an interesting word, uh, it's translated empty deception. I'll show you how this word is used. It really means vapor, it means nothing. Uh, and then here is nine, as for the Generous, he will be blessed because he gives his food to the poor. Now, here's the way I'm going to teach these Proverbs. This is what I believe that they are saying to us in a practical way. And so I've arranged them in short little statements. And for verse 6, it is this. Teach and pray, pray and teach. Here's 7. The cold, cruel world is not us. The cold, cruel world is not us. And verse 8, watching the wicked grab for air. Watching the wicked grab for air. And finally, verse 9, the spirit of I get to. The spirit of I get to. Okay, here is our first proverb this morning, 22.6, the famous proverb. And I have not changed the translation, although I would like to alliterate it. I have stayed with the translation that most use, and I will explain it as I go, because there is a lot of information in the way that these words are arranged. Uh, first of all, the word train, dedicate, it is a very rare imperative from the Old Testament. In the ancient Near East, culturally, a mother would take dates, crush them into juice, and rub the palate uh, of the child to teach the child to build a taste and appetite for consumption. That's the way that the word was used secularly among the culture and the people. Biblically, the word is very much more narrow. It's a strong commitment to a certain course of action. I'll give you some illustrations of that. You see the word often in 1 Kings 8 with the commemoration of the temple, Solomon's temple. And so they dedicated it uh, and they set it aside for the purpose of worship. Uh, 
Psalm 30, verse 1, the superscription, which we consider to be Holy Scripture. Uh, the superscription reads, a song of dedication. There's our word for the temple. Set aside, set apart for a certain course, direction. Here is uh, its use in 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 28. Hannah dedicated her firstborn, Samuel, to the Lord. She took him to Eli the priest at Shiloh, and she left him. She says, I lent him to the Lord. That's our word. She dedicated him to the Lord's purpose. So that is illustrations and uses of the word to dedicate, to train. Now, look at this these three words, in the way, meaning moral direction. A uh, child uh, is any age from adolescence all the way up through uh, what we would call the high school, early college years. That's the word child. And, uh, and it has an interesting word combination to it. Notice in the top line, this is kind of the tricky part. It is, we dedicate the child in a moral direction, and notice it's he, he or she, that's the child itself. But the word is not direction. It's not way, exactly. It's pointed differently, so it is different. And this is the interesting way the word was used. Uh, Lot's daughters are contemplating immorality with their father at the cave at Zoar. And they speak to one another in concocting this plan. And their desire was to raise up children, and they use this word, according to our nature. Uh, like us, is what they are saying. And... Uh, what God think of that? Well, he cursed it. And from that, you get the nation of Moab and Ammon. That's what he thought of it. Uh, but that's the word, and that's how the word is used and applied. So here we are, should go. It's the dedication in a certain direction. Now, I want you to think about regulations. Think about rules. That's the idea here. And it's used in a very, very interesting context in the Old Testament. Genesis chapter 43 and verse 7 is how it's used. Let me give you the story collapsed and you'll see how interesting this word is. The sons of Jacob have gone down into Egypt for their first trip. They come back and they bring their sacks of grain into their father Jacob's tent. And they open the sacks, and there's their money. The money that they went down to buy the grain for, but it's there. And then they tell their father this very interesting story. This official down in Egypt, this man is very harsh. He accused us of being spies. And, uh, and here's the way the English translates it. He interrogated us. One translation is detail closely. The other is carefully. The other is particularly. Well, he interrogated them and he set forth from our proverb. This word uh, should go. Rules and regulations. Certain standards. Now, what were those standards? Well, here they were. They were, Simeon stays here. He's a hostage. And in order to come back and buy further grain, I'm not interested in your mother, your money, I'm interested in your youngest brother, Benjamin. You've got to bring him, or you buy no food and you see my face no more. See, those were the certain standards. Now, what crazy standards are those? Well, 
They're the standards of the man who ran Egypt. That's the standards. He made the rules. Now, we as Americans understand this word because we go to trial and we put our hand on the Bible, solidifying its authority on and over us. And what's a certain standard that we amplify our testimony to that authority? Well, here it is to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Those are the certain standards by which we conduct our own testimony in a court. So that's the idea, and that should go. Now, here's the tricky part. The he and she, the child with the nature. It's in a form that refers to a child's temperament, a child's emotional state. Now, here is the way that that practically works out from the Bible. Uh, Genesis 25, 27, it is the sons of Isaac. And when the boys grew up, Esau, one of the twins, was a hunter, a man of the field. And Jacob, the other brother, the twin, not identical, but the twin, what about him? Well, he's a quiet man dwelling in tents. So quite a bit different, isn't it? How about another illustration? 1 Samuel 17, David is coming to the battle lines and there are the Philistines. Uh, and suddenly here's this mocking of the Lord God from this giant by the name of Goliath. And what did he do? His blood boiled. And you get that great statement from uh, the King James. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that dares defy the armies of the living God? That's David. Young David. What about his brothers? They heard that mocking. They heard the same thing. Did their blood boil? No, their blood was frozen. <laughs> they weren't about to step on that battlefield. Quite a bit different temperaments. Personalities. Are you like your brother? Are you like your sister? Quite a bit different, aren't you? God arranges families. That's Psalm 127. And we are all different participants in the family. And we're different. And this child training is to be arranged according to the nature and the temperament of the child. Now, here's line two. All the translations in English read and and even. Very important conjunction because it makes sure that we don't misinterpret the top line. So that's why we acknowledge it. So in Israel, the question was, did you raise your children did you raise them in a dedicated form to the oral tradition of the law? Because nobody had Bibles back then. Did they follow the Word of God in raising their children? Okay, so here is the second line. Look at the word when. It's, it's the providence for us. It was true for raising the child at that moment, and it is going to be true for the future of that child. And what's the future? Well, there's your word old. It's Proverbs 20, 29, the majesty of gray hair for those of you who have it. Unfortunately, I have no hair. <laughs> um, and then look at this, depart from it. Literally, uh, the Hebrew language is so fascinating to me because it's so, it paints pictures all the time. And here's this word. It's Proverbs 3, 7. It is not turning aside. See? So we stay on the path and we get in trouble when we get off the path. And so we don't turn aside. Proverbs 3, 7. The irony of all of this is that the very man who wrote the proverb is the man that turned aside? It just, that's 
people. All right, so what do we make of the proverb? Well, let me begin by saying there's no formula for raising godly children. If I don't care how many books on child rearing, leadership, uh, whatever, there is no formula for it. Um, and I've seen it all in the years of ministry. I have seen young people like a rocket and they don't look back over their shoulder. In my Friday morning Bible study in Oklahoma City, suddenly one morning, 15 years ago or so, this 15-year-old boy in the midst of all these businessmen that are in their 30s, 40s, 50s, this 16-year-old boy shows up, sits on the front row, and he's taking notes like it's the last course of his life. Well, that young man uh, graduated. He went to Harvard, and then he got a medical fellowship to Duke. And his father told me just the other day that he is coming to Dallas for a one-year fellowship. And he brought his father to the Bible study. I've seen that. I've seen some children like a Saturn rocket. And I have seen others that were raised that way and they fall away and I've seen them come back. I've seen it all, but there's no formulas here. Uh, I will tell you that uh, I addressed my daughter some years back, and uh, I formally apologized to her. Uh, I was not sensitive to her, as this top line would say. I, I raised her like her brother. Her brother was easy. He was an athlete. and. You know, his major concerns in life is when do we eat and when does the bus leave? Uh, but my daughter, she's, a, she's an artist and much more complex. And I didn't do a good job. And I told her that. And I'm glad I did. She actually, in her early adolescence, spent a week with the Duncans. And... I'm very, very grateful to this day for that week in her life because she bonded very closely with Jeanette Duncan. And that week has been like a reoccurring theme in her life. She, Jeanette had a great ministry and impact on her, and I'm very grateful. But look, it's real easy to look at a text like this and... Uh, well, let's just conceive of launching a ship because that's really what we're doing, training up children. We're launching children into the world. And it's real easy, you know, when you're building that boat in the dry dock on the land, you know, got the land around, you've got all of the accoutrements built up around the boat, and everybody's got platforms to stand, and there's welders, and they're working diligently, and and you've got your blueprints and your plans. That, that, I understand. That's your text here. But when the boat goes into the water, it's all different. Because uh, now you're subject to the currents. Now you're subject to the winds. And there's enemies out there. You didn't have enemies on the dry dock. No. You, you built them in the peace and pleasure of your home. Look, teach your children and pray over your children. Um, pray over your children and teach your children. Some guy asked me a long time ago, how do, you, how do I teach my son to pray? Here's how you teach your son to pray. You get right down next to him and you pray. That's how you teach him to pray. And you pray about the very things that his world is. You know, Tommy's uh, spot dog that is missing a block over or uh, I can't find my baseball mitt. And you pray over those things because that's his world. 
That's how you teach them to pray. And let them see that you are the one who is not only instructing, but being instructed by the Lord yourself. You see, uh, they're not looking for perfect parents. They're looking for real parents. And your genuine walk with the Lord will bear fruit somehow, some way. And I'm not going to make this a hard and fast proverb. It was written for parents to raise children. So trust God and do everything that you can do. Now, here's seven. The rich rule over the poor. The rich who are depicted always in wisdom literature as mostly arrogant and evil people. Rules is the idea. It is the word to lord over or to oppress. That's what they do. In the life of Elisha, a widow whose husband was one of the sons of the prophets, um, she appealed to this man of God that a one who was a ruler, it's our word, rules, uh, the English version translates it as creditors. That's really the idea. Uh, she tells Elisha that this wicked person is coming to take her two children and make them slaves because of her late husband's indebtedness. Thus, this poor and this weak and oppressed woman is subject to this form of cruelty. Now, you see the word and there in your translation. It's very important because it combines the two lines into a compound sentence. So we're still talking about one and the same. The borrower is the party who has lost control and they are subject to being a slave or a servant as a result. They've lost their freedom to the lender, to the creditor. Now, the charging of interest to the poor in Israel was forbidden in the law. Uh, we, they were to practice hesed, covenant faithfulness, one to another. In the book of Proverbs, uh, in the book of Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 28, 12, Israel was permitted to grant loans to outsiders. But what people fail to focus on is the reason that that was permitted. It was permitted so that Israel would have a testimony to the outside world, to the Gentiles, to the Goyim. Remember, Israel was to be a light to the nations. They were to learn about God by their distinctive behavior following the Lord and His law. Here's a great illustration. The best are always in the Bible. 2 Kings 6. You don't need to turn there. You know the story. It's a very famous story. The Syrian soldiers came and they surrounded Dothan where Elisha was located. You know, here's the picture. They grabbed the megaphone. Come out with your hands up. We got you surrounded. That's the idea. And the servant of Elisha walks out and he sees all these Syrians. He runs back in in a panic and he tells the prophet, we're surrounded. Well, the prophet, his attitude was like a a cold pond in a deep forest. It was just nothing. And then you get that great line. One of these days I'd like to preach on that line. They who are with us are greater than they who are with them. Hot there. But uh, he goes, I praise, and the young man goes out and he sees horses, chariots of fire, and they're surrounding the Syrians. And that's where you got the, the movie titled Chariots of Fire, the award-winning story of Eric Liddell winning the Olympic gold, Chariots of Fire. 
And so the prophet prays again. The English text says to put blindness. It, it's really the idea of putting the Syrians into a stupor, into a trance. Because Elisha the prophet walks up to the leader of that band and said, follow me, I'll take you to the man you're looking for. Well, what did he do? He led them right down into the middle of the Israeli army. Now, those who had surrounded Dotham are now surrounded. Imagine in World War II, you line up all of the SS soldiers in their black uniforms, and they march steadfast right into the middle of General Patton's 7th Army. Uh, that's the idea. And then, uh, then the trance is lifted, and suddenly these Syrians see themselves totally surrounded, outnumbered. They're dead men. And the king asked the prophet, Elisha, what should we do now? Kill them? <laughs> no. You feed them and you let them go home. You see, that's Hesed. It's different. You are to be different people. That's the idea. You look at the people of Israel today, the Jews. They're not known for kindness. They're not known for their generosity. No, they, they're unique. They have spectacular gifts as mercantiles, but they just blend into this selfish and self-centered world like everybody else. And therefore, they defied the idea. They were to be separate. They were to be distinct. <coughs> I got a call a few weeks ago from a federal judge that I have known in Oklahoma City for a long time. And uh, he had an issue with a piece of personal property and I was able to help him. I was just kind of positioned to help him and uh, got the matter transacted and uh, got a check back to him for it. And there in the stub of the check is the commission and it's been taken out of the check and I just replaced it with my own cash and sent it to him. And uh, why did I do that? Well, here's why I did it. This man has heard me teach before. He's an unbeliever. I've got to show him that I'm different. And then I will treat him differently. I've got to be separate, distinct. You know, um, Jeff Brown. He entitles his class, the Peculiar People class. Great name. That's it. We're different. We're separated. That's the idea. Uh, you know that great verse in 1 Thessalonians 4, 11. Um, you, you live a quiet and peaceful life, says the apostle, working with your hands, that you're not dependent on anyone. That's 4.11. What about 4.12? 4.12 says, so that you outsiders look at you and they see that your testimony from your mouth lines up with the way you live. You're separate. You're distinct. You're different. That's the idea. And so... Israel, unfortunately, has lost their way. You know, Warren showed me a couple of pictures back a few weeks ago of his father. And uh, his father, it was his father on the back of the wolf's lair with, uh, where Hitler went and vacationed. And so you have the, you have the father showing pictures to the sun and the war stories. Well, think about the Syrians. Think about their war story. Here we are, surrounded, outnumbered. We're dead men. But what they do, they showed us unusual kindness. And think of how that story resonates down to the children 
year after year after year. We are to be a distinct people. And that's the proverb. Here's eight. The sowing of injustice. It's a proverb about retribution. Those who practice injustice will meet the harsh reality of divine providence. And that's the end of their wrong and their wrongdoing. Notice the two images in the proverb. The top line is sowing and the second line is rod. Both images depict the rich arrogant as exercising cruel misconduct against a neighbor. And we remember a neighbor. A neighbor is a third party. Not a relative, not a friend, just the man on the street, a third party. And perhaps this proverb was a part of the inspiration of the Apostle Paul in that famous Galatians 6-7. Do not be deceived. God's not mocked. Whatsoever a man sows, that's what he's going to reap. Clearly, the proverb here connects actions to consequences. So look at that word so. Think about it, top line. You have to work diligently like a farmer to sow injustice, corruption. That's what Washington does all the time, 24-7. Devising evil schemes every day. Um, injustice is to pervert falsely. And it's always in the Proverbs associated with verbs of doing. Clearly definable illegal actions to do injustice. That's the word. So here it is, Psalm 71 verse 4. Rescue me, O God, from the hand of the wicked, from the grasp, and here is our word, injustice of the cruel man. See, he's a rule breaker. Crimes that are commercial, that would be an exchange of things who can result in an innocent party's death. Dan and I had a friend. He is alive in heaven now. But he was a powerful oil and gas attorney. And he told a story to us once that he was selling uh, oil and gas pipelines, uh, all kinds of equipment back to a government in Central America. And a place was loaded with corruption in every direction. And he met for these negotiations in New York City. And it was long and arguous, late into the night. And on about midweek, Wednesday, he gets a call on the phone and he's told, don't leave the hotel for any reason. We have been tipped off that you're on a hit list. And until we get bodyguards to you, you are to stay put. That's what's going on here. It's uh, the injustice can render an innocent party's death. Now, reap consequences from the book of consequences. An empty deception. Uh, this is such an interesting word. You, your translation may have calamity, vanity, sorrows. The wicked sow injustice, hoping to reap more than their investment, and instead divine providence returns to them. And here's your word, nothing. It's actually found in Zechariah chapter 10 and verse 2 as empty vapor. You're just grasping at nothing. See, God will see to that. That's the idea here. And line 2, the rod, the symbol of authority, the unjust oppresses, uses it to beat down the oppressed. He wheels his fury... That's uh, Proverbs 21, 24, the mocker who beha behaves with insolent fury. That's the word. It's literally outburst. It is the profanity 
of mocking God from the mouth. And here's the consequences that it rendered Goliath. His mocking. David heard the mocking. It provoked his anger. And it cost the giant his life. Should have kept his mouth shut. Now look at these last two words. Will fail. That's a future certainty of the sovereignty of God. That He will take those who abuse people, who abuse their power, and He will bring them to utter ruin. Emptiness. Now, this may happen in the here and now, or it may happen in the judgment. One way or the other, this wickedness is going to be accounted for. It is a terrifying thing to fall in the hands of the living God. What's our attitude to be in the meantime? Well, David gives it to us in Psalm 37. We don't fret over the wicked doer because he, 37, 36, he will pass away and be no more you will not be able to find him. Now, here's our final proverb for the morning. I'm going to get you out on time. Verse 9, As for the generous, he will be blessed because he gives food to the poor. A previous proverb just said that the wicked are going to fail. Here, notice, the generous are going to be blessed. The skill for living, wisdom, is to practice generosity and practice it daily. Our top line opens. As for the generous, it is literally the good eye. Good depends the desirable quality of bringing useful and advancing life forward. And the eye reveals the character of the person. The eyes are mentioned in Proverbs to be watched. We got that from Proverbs 6, 17. The arrogant had haughty eyes. Remember the six things that the Lord hates. Here is the good eye, the generous person, sharply contrasted in his righteousness with the wicked. It's the fundamental nature of wisdom, skill, to be generous to all. That's the spirit of wisdom. Now let me give you the spirit of wisdom's own testimony to us all. It's 9-4, whoever is simple, that's me, naive. Turn here, says wisdom. You who lack judgment, come eat my bread, drink my wine. In other words, it's given away freely. That's the spirit of wisdom. There's no charge for this. Look at line two, our translation. Because or for, it's going to explain to us. Just like we had in 2021, Same kind of grammar. It sets forth the activity with the explanation for the person's blessing. And look, the skillful man, the skillful woman, behaves just exactly like the Spirit of Wisdom taught us in chapter 9. Giving away freely. That's the idea. So it is thinking that leads to deeds that determines destiny. The harvest of a crop, you see the Israeli farmer work diligently. Why? So he could be prosperous for himself? No, so he could give away more generously. That's the idea. Let me give you just the facts. Sergeant Friday, just the facts. Here they are. Now, Genesis 18, that marvelous story. That's one of my favorites. 
in the Bible. You know, here is Abram. He's sitting in his tent. He's just at peace in the heat of the day when suddenly these three dots appear on the horizon and they're moving toward him. And he immediately, the text says, he jumps up. He runs. He gives orders. We've got to feed these men. We've got to take care of them. We've got to wash their feet. He is a ball of activity in his generosity. You see the white towel over his arm here? He is a servant. That's Abram. What took place there? Think about this. He took what God gave him, that calf. And he had the honor, the privilege of giving it right back to the Lord Himself. Who gets to do that? Dan's lessons on the woman at the well. John 4. He asked for a drink. Who gets to do that? Actually feed, give a drink to the Lord Himself. What an incredible thing this is. And then, don't miss this. In the midst of His generosity, in the midst of His activity, the biggest door of His planned purpose life swings wide open for Him. Remember? The voice eating, where is your wife, Sarah? How did they know that that was His wife's name? And then these words, surely I will return to you this time next year and you will have a son. What's the context of all that? Generosity. Kindness. Going above and beyond. That's the spirit of wisdom. That's what it's teaching. Wisdom teaches generosity. Be people, peculiar people, uncommon people. Practice it. Make it a daily habit. Uh, my good friend Jay Bruce, who's an attorney, is the chief executive of American Bank Systems. He puts at the bottom of his letterhead, you haven't lived today until you can do something for someone who can never pay you back. I love that. That's what the proverb is telling us. Walk in wisdom. Be generous. And in doing so, the doors of God will swing wide open for you. And Abram is the proof text for it. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for our time of study this morning. Thank You for the elders and the deacons and the service they render to this church. Thank You for these people. Peculiar people. Uncommon people that rise up to hear Your Word. Bless them. Enrich them with power, with potency. That's blessing. And use them to carry on the great work of Your kingdom. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.